we're going to talk about Chinese economy, their economy, the structure of their economy, and how it can contribute to the socialism and the future of socialism. Okay. This is a difficult con uh, conversation for a number of reasons. Because of the rising Cold War between the United States and China, that's one complication. The second complication is the fact that what socialism means in China has been and continues to be a, a topic about which there is much disagreement. There is a very deep, long-lasting debate in China over what socialism means. And the third complication is that most of the world is not very clear about what the major different definitions of socialism are in the whole world, not just in China. So it's very complicated. So I'll try to make it clear, but it'll take a few minutes for us to understand what's going on. So I'll take them one by one, these three points, these three complexities. First, the people who made the revolution in China were the people who organized, developed, and led the Chinese Communist Party. It was a party that came out of the global splits among socialists that happened in 1918, 1919, 1920. The large global socialist movement, which included Chinese intellectuals, Chinese workers, split after 1917 because for the first time, socialists were not merely opposition in socialist unions, in socialist political parties, but they captured a government in Russia, creating the Soviet Union. That was the first socialist successful becoming a power, a government in power. And around the world, socialists divided, they split into those who saw in the success in Russia a model. This is what we should do because look, these socialists took the next step from being critics of capitalism, from being opponents of capitalism, they became the leaders of an alternative system socialism. So we socialists, we must support, defend, and copy the Soviet Union. Then there were other socialists, including many who were happy about the Soviet Union, many who celebrated the Soviet Union, but these were people who also believed that the Soviet leadership Lenin, Trotsky, Stalin, and the others were making important mistakes that should not be copied. They were also people who felt that the conditions in Russia were different enough from conditions elsewhere in the world that you shouldn't copy. You had to make big adjustments for different conditions so that the United States or Germany or Cuba were different enough from Russia to what? Okay, so the movements everywhere split. Socialists who did not want the Soviet Union to be the model held on to the name socialist. Whereas the socialists who supported the Soviet Union and wanted to be allied with them took the name communists. And that's where the split between socialists and communists emerges. And it happened in most countries around the world. Those few years were the beginning, for example, of the Communist Party in Russia, 
of the Communist Party in the United States, of the Communist Party in China, and so on. For the next period, roughly 1918 to 1949, that's a long time, 30 years, the Communist Party of China developed and grew. For a while, they did it publicly, and they took one kind of position quite close to traditional social democracy. As they grew, the bourgeois revolution, also happening in China, led by a leader called Chiang Kai-shek, turned against the Communist Party, seeing them as a threat and a danger, which happened in other countries too, and socialists and capitalists together went after destroying the Communist Party, and Mao Zedong had to take the Communist Party out of the cities into the distant rural countryside of China, and he, he stayed there for 20 years. The constituency of the party shifted from urban worker to rural peasant, and that made an enormous difference. So socialism meant a completely different thing in the urban worker environment in the 1920s from what it meant in the distant rural uh, peasant environment of the next 40, uh, the next 20 years. In 1949, the Communist Party Army, 8th Army, defeats Chiang Kai-shek, the uh, socialist and bourgeois Chinese leave and go to Taiwan, and the Communist Party becomes the government. If I had time, I would take you through from 1949 to 1960, the Chinese tried different kinds of socialism. In industry, they tried, for example, in some places and at some times to copy the Soviet Union, their ally, which meant government takeover of enterprises in industry. In the rural areas, they tried a different kind of socialism in the movement they called communes, the communes of the 50s and 60s, the time of what in China is called the Great Leap Forward under the Mao Zedong government. After Mao passes and the Chinese have enormous problems, remember, they are one of the poorest countries in the world, and they have the largest population of any country in the world. These are two tremendous difficulties, and they have the enmity of the United States. They make an enormously important decision in the 1970s. They cannot stay. I mean, part of these decisions were made earlier. So don't get attached to the, to the dates. It's not so important. The big decision they make in the 60s and into the 70s is to abandon the communes and to not follow the Soviet Union, which causes a split between China and the Soviet Union, including military clashes between them, a means that the Chinese have to go alone. They're not going to get the kind of support from the Soviet Union that they had had early. And again, to make a long story short, they decided that in order to survive, they had to define socialism in a new way, not the Soviet way, not the commune way, but in a unique way, which came to be called socialism with Chinese characteristics. And here, here is what it is. Think of the world as having two basic kinds of socialism developed mostly in the 20th century. One kind is Soviet Union. The government comes in, takes over the enterprises, throws out the private owners, closes the stock market, 
the government is now the owner and the operator of industry. It lets agriculture be, but slowly moves it in the same direction with collective farms, state farms, and so on. That's one notion of what socialism is. It's Soviet socialism. But there is another different kind of socialism. It's what you find in Sweden or Norway or Denmark or Germany or Italy or France. In this case, you have capitalism, private enterprises owned and operated by private individuals, but with a powerful regulatory apparatus operated by the government. So you have minimum wage that has to be paid to every worker. You have government provided free education, government provided free health care, government, you get the picture. Okay. So socialism in those countries means what other people call social democracy or democratic socialism. Uh, it's what Bernie Sanders advocates in the United States. It's what the socialist parties in Western and Eastern Europe mean by socialism. So the two, you know, being simple, the two images are Soviet, take over, run the enterprise, Western European, re have government regulation, but leave the capitalists private. China makes a crucial decision to do neither one of those, but to create a hybrid, a very complicated mixture of both so that a huge portion of its economy is owned and operated by the government. But an equally or, or greater even part of the economy is owned and operated by private citizens, both Chinese and foreign. It brought in, it welcomed American, European, Japanese companies to come in there, and it helped Chinese entrepreneurs develop their private business. So China is a unique kind of socialism, a third variety, neither the Soviet model nor the Western European social democracy model. China did that together with a strategic objective to become the dominant exporter of manufactured products. So it invited private enterprises to become particularly important in the production of consumer goods and capital goods in China for export back to the countries from which they came. They hoped that the opening to Western uh, G7 companies would bring them distribution of what was produced in China into the market of the world, which was much more important than the Chinese market back then starting in the 1970s and 80s and running up to the present. So, for example, a small department store in the United States, in a small backward state here, Arkansas, in a small town in Arkansas, was one of the first to realize that it could grow if it became the way for cheap Chinese goods to be brought to the American consumer. The name of that company, Walmart. It is now the biggest company in the world, okay? That development of the United States Walmart is un impossible without China. It is the first way to understand that the last 40 years have been unusually profitable 
and prosperous for the United States and even more unusual and prosperous for China. It was 30 years, roughly 18, 1970 to roughly 2015, more or less. Half a century, more or less. Important to notice, during that time, good relations between the United States and China, no war, no threat of war, no conflict, both countries growing, prospering, profiting, okay? Because it, the idea that that's not possible is, the, is refuted by the actual history we already had. But China learned, as the whole world has learned, that what the Chinese discovered is the most successful capitalism in the, or excuse me, socialism in the world today. Why? Because the Chinese grew from one of the poorest countries in the world to the number two economic power in the world. And it did it in 40 years. That has never happened in human history before. It took centuries for Britain to become an important dominant economic power. It took at least a century and a half for the United States to reach and occupy that position. And neither of them was as poor to begin with as the Chinese. So they have come further in a shorter amount of time in terms of going from a poor country to a middle income level. And that is one of the most important reasons why the world, the global South, which is composed of poor countries who want to stop being poor, look to the Chinese because they are, the Chinese, the most successful project in the world so far. And so, of course, the people of Brazil or of Nigeria or of Malaysia uh, look to the Chinese. Where else should they look? And the Chinese have not disappointed them. Over the last 30 years, for example, years, 40 years, years during which the United States was very profitable and grew, and the Chinese grew without war between them. But across those 40 years, the average rate of growth of the United States was between 2 and 3% and the GDP per year. And the average rate of growth of GDP per year in China was 6 to 9%. There is no contest. There is no struggle. One side performs better than the other. And this is not, China has lots of problems. China will have all kinds of difficulties in the future. So this is not a celebration of China. This is looking at the facts as they are recorded by the CIA, by the World Bank, by the IMF, and by others. It's just silly to make believe otherwise, and it's a bit childish. So for me, the Chinese have established a new world. What they were able to achieve is the greatest economic growth story we have. They grew further faster from a poorer base than the Soviet Union did in the 20th century. And they were the fast growth story last year's century. The United States has tried, but cannot keep up. The United States has tried, but cannot go ahead. Not only do the Chinese grow, but they have equivalent enterprises at the highest levels of technology. They have a Chinese equivalent of Apple, of Amazon, 
of Google, of Intel, and I could go on. So the real question now is this. As, uh, by the way, current year, latest IMF statistics, the countries that will grow fastest this year, if you take the G7 plus Russia and China, that's nine countries, according to the IMF, the fastest growth among them will once again be the People's Republic of China, estimate five, five and a half percent. Russia is expected to grow 3%. The United States, 2%. Great Britain will not grow at all. It will shrink. Germany will be either zero or slightly negative. That's the reality for the rest of this year and for 2024. So nothing is changing. Nothing. And you can't stop it because the two economies for 40 years grew together. They depend on each other in a in hundred ways beyond the ability of the government in either society to do much about it. So the efforts of the United States government, whether it be tariffs under Trump or going after Huawei Corporation or subsidizing American uh, computer chip companies under Biden. These are marginal. These make a difference, but they're more symbolic than they will not change the underlying pattern. So here comes the conclusion. And it takes us back to your first question about the G20. The issue is, will the United States and its allies, the G7, and China and its allies, the BRICS, will they be able to sit down and work out a way to coexist and grow in this on this planet, or will they destroy one another and the planet with them. That's the, that's the issue that has to be addressed. All the rest is political infighting that is a diversion from dealing with these problems. And they will keep up with these diversions because those problems are very difficult to solve. The United States doesn't want to give up the position it had and the Chinese do not want to be, in their words, humiliated again. They had that in the 19th century. They had it in the 20th. They're not going there again. And they don't need to, and they know it. That's the issue. The, the meeting of the G20 failed even to recognize the issue, let alone solve it. And so it sits there as the issue to be dealt with. And nothing shows the futility of where we are. Nothing shows it better than the United States pursuing the international court to have Putin arrested, which prevents sitting down and working something out. And on the other side, the decision by Putin and Xi Jinping not to go to the G20 meeting. This shows you that the two major players who have to get together are not ready to do it. Just like they're not ready yet to sit down uh, to resolve the small version of this story, which is the war in Ukraine. And you can see the horrific price being paid by the people of Ukraine as this stalemate, this failure to address the problem continues on the part of both 
of the major players. How do you see the China's economy today and what do we need to learn from it? Well, in basic terms, uh, China went from being an extremely poor country in 1978 when it started its market reforms and opening after the Cultural Revolution. Uh, now, 45 years later, it's a uh, an upper middle income country about to be a high income country that is at the cutting edge of many <laughs> important technologies. And uh, if it's uh, correct what we're reading, Huawei has just uh, introduced a uh, leading new smartphone using a uh, very advanced chip that rivals uh, NVIDIA's A100 chip. So uh, we're still waiting to hear whether that's actually the case, but seems to be the case. So China is a very successful economy and it will continue to be dynamic. This is freaking out the American uh, policymakers who are doing everything they can think of to try to stop China's growth right now. I don't think China's growth is going to stop. I think it's going to continue because China is doing the, the real homework of economic development, which is large scale investment in human skills, first of all. Uh, so high education, science and technology. Uh, secondly, in physical infrastructure, uh, which is quite outstanding and continuing to improve with thousands of kilometers of fast rail. We don't have any in the United States uh, with 5G systems across the entire country uh, and so forth, and investment in uh, commercial and business capital, and China's investing heavily there too. Uh, China is reaching out to other countries in, in international trade, uh, and it is uh, also using its uh, high saving to promote the export of uh, China's goods and services, especially its great infrastructure building capacity to countries that really need uh, what China has to offer. That is uh, modernized infrastructure, fast rail, for example, or power generation. So I see an economy that will continue to develop and the headwinds that it faces uh, are not uh, the things we read about in the press uh, all the time right now of uh, the great uh, debt crisis and so forth. The headwinds that China faces are geopolitical. Uh, they're the United States trying to stop China's progress. I don't think that it uh, is going to work. And I think China will continue to become uh, a, uh, even more technologically sophisticated economy, providing a lot of things that uh, the rest of the world wants and needs. Do you think that the China's economy would be the next course of the economy in the in universities to to teach and learn? Well, it should anyway be uh, what just happened over the last forty five years, uh, because this is quite an astounding uh, case. What's interesting, since I teach these subjects, uh, uh, I think the country that got there first in this kind of rapid economic development was Japan, uh, both in the late 19th century and then again after World War II, after disasters that Japan itself had provoked. Um, very rapid growth, and that gave lessons to the uh, so-called Asian tiger economies uh, Taiwan, uh, Korea, uh, Hong Kong, and Singapore. And that gave lessons to uh, China. Uh, okay, this is the path to fast growth. And Deng Xiaoping took it uh, and uh, promoted uh, what became 40 years of remarkable dynamism. So this absolutely should be studied and understood. It is an East Asian phenomenon more broadly, uh, Japan, Korea, Hong Kong, Taiwan, Singapore, uh, PRC have all shared in, in this kind of very rapid uh, and dynamic growth that's based on high levels of investment and saving and a very strong balance across human investments, 
infrastructure investments and business investments.